Okay, we're going to continue on with our discussion of non-infectious causes of reduced reproductive performance uh, in cattle. So far we've talked to you about cystic ovarian disease, anestrus, and a range of other factors that affect reproductive performance. In this section we're going to focus on the effects due to breed, heat stress, and nutrition. The learning objectives for this section are for you by the end of this section to be able to describe the worldwide trend in reduced reproductive performance that's been observed in the high producing dairy cows. Be able to explain what some of the causes of this decline in reproductive performance may be associated with. We'll introduce the concept of phantom cows and um, you should know how they have a negative effect on herd reproductive performance. You should be able to explain when reproductive performance of cows might be detrimentally affected by heat stress and why, and what management strategies you can use to help minimise the negative effects of heat stress on herd reproductive performance. Then finally we'll take a quick look at some nutritional factors that can affect pregnancy rates and you should be able to list um, some of those nutritional factors that can affect reproductive performance. First of all, let's look at the high producing dairy cow and what's been happening. Um, there's been a negative trend in reproductive performance for the high producing dairy cow over the past 20-30 years. Over that period of time, milk production has progressively increased, but we've seen a progressive decline in reproductive performance in dairy cows. Some of the factors that have been associated with this decline in fertility include a decrease in conception rates, an increase in the number of services per conception, an increase in the calving to conception interval, an increase in the interval from calving to first ovulation, a decrease in the duration of standing estrus, and all of this has been associated with an increased use of American Holstein genetics, so so-called Holsteinization of the um, dairy herds. In spite of all of these negative effects on fertility, the fertility of maiden heifers appears to have remained unchanged. So prior to the first calf, the dairy heifers that are destined to become high producing dairy cows, their fertility is equivalent to what it was 20-30 years ago. So it's only after calving that we're seeing this decline in reproductive performance. Graphically, um, this is just um, the trend in reproductive performance is just illustrated in this graph. You can see how since the 1950s it's been a progressive increase in milk yield in cows. And if we look at conception rates to artificial insemination back in the 1950s were in the order of 60 or more percent. But now they've declined to the point at which they are 40 percent or less. So you get over a 20 percent reduction in, con in conception rate over the last 50-60 uh, years in dairy cows. This is just another graph um, that shows the number of days that a cow um, remains open. This is an American terminology or the number of days that it, it's not, it remains not pregnant for following calving. And You can see how there's been a progressive increase in the number of days open, particularly since the 1980s here. Um, so it's taking cows longer to get in calf and it's taking more services per conception for them to get in calf so they're having to be inseminated more often before they get pregnant. So just to summarise, conception rates are declining, the number of services per conception is increasing, and the number of days from calving to conception or days open is increasing as milk yield in increases. Now this is, uh, this is not just the results from one study, but a num number of studies have reported on this trend. The average reduction in conception rate per year between 1975 and 1997 in one study was at almost 0.5% per year. In the United Kingdom, in another study, it was in the order of 1%, and this was also similar in an Irish study where it was uh, minus 0.9%. So it's, a, it's quite a dramatic change over time where you get a gradual reduction in, in 
certain conception rate occurring. This is another study looking at the average calving interval in American Holstein cows from 1970 to 2005. You can see um, back in the 70s there was a, almost a 12 to 13 month intercalving interval, but how this has uh, steadily increased and up to 15 16 month intercalving interval. So cows are not producing one calf per year in some of these high producing herds. This graph shows how there's been a change in the duration of estrus, so the number of hours in which cows stay in heat as we look at in relation to milk yield in one particular study. As milk yield increased uh, up to a level of 60 kilograms per day, um, you can see that the duration, the average duration in which cows stayed in heat was much shorter. Now, the 60 kilograms of milk per day, 60 litres of milk per day is an enormous amount of milk. So these cows are, are basically milk producing factories. They're really producing a lot of milk. There's not too many cows in the Australian industry that will be doing that routinely. This is much more like the Australian industry where we're producing more like um, 25 to 35 litres. It's much more common per day. This is uh, looking at uh, a number of other studies that have looked at the duration of estrus in dairy cows. Um, and you can see it's quite variable. Um, but there is a trend that over time, from the 1920s, 40s, how it it's, has gotten a little bit shorter. But if you look at um, the duration of estrus in heifers, this hasn't changed. So just to summarise um, uh, this information, reduced reproductive performance in the high producing dairy cow seems to be manifested following the onset of the first lactation. That is, fertility in maiden heifers appears to be similar today than it was with, in previous reports in heifers from several years ago. Now, although the trend to reduce reproductive performance um, is associated with an increase in milk yield, in dairy herds in Australian studies, high yield is not strongly correlated to fertility. So what this means is the problem does not lie entirely with increasing production. So you can't walk into a herd and say, oh, that, that cow there that's producing 45 litres, she's going to have worse fertility than that cow that's producing 25 litres. It doesn't always happen. Um, so there's other factors going on here as well. What are some of the causes of this decline in fertility in dairy cows? Well, people are still trying to work that out. Um, but it, it's likely to be multifactorial, not, not a single factor be involved here. Because pregnancy rates of heifers are not, not affected, it suggests that changes that occur following calving, that is changes in nutrition, diet, energy demands um, that cows have to meet because they're basically genetically geared to produce high volumes of milk, um, that places quite a, a large energy demand on them. And so this is, exacerbates negative, a negative energy balance in those cows. And this is something that heifers may not be exposed to as maiden heifers. So as soon as they calve, they're suddenly exposed to a change in diet, a, a much um, greater negative energy balance. Their livers are, have, are much more metabolically active. So these are quite um, uh, drastic changes that are occurring following calving. And so this may be one of the reasons why the uh, fertility of heifers is not affected compared to cows. Of course to, to fuel this um, extra uh, extra level of milk production there's been a steadily steady increase in the amount of dry matter that, that is fed to cows um, and there's, a, there's an associated increase in metabolic rate um, associated with that increased level of milk production. This is associated with an increased blood flow to the liver an increase in clearance rates of hormones such as progesterone and estrogen which are metabolized in, in the liver. So if the liver is more, more metabolically active, you've got a, a more greater blood flow to the liver. As those hormones pass through the liver, they're, they're rapidly cleared from the system. So the, the, the average levels or com concentrations of those hormones in blood actually decreases compared to say heifers or cows from 20-30 years ago. And this results in a decrease in circulating concentrations of, of major reproductive hormones such as progesterone and estrogen. So these cows are faced with an increase in negative energy balance. 
they're also faced with an increase in concentrate feeding so diets that are high in carbohydrates and perhaps a bit lower in fiber than what they um, traditionally were exposed to there's a higher prevalence of anestrous cows and the intervals postpartum to first ovulation are, are longer and of course there's probably some unknown things going on that we're not aware of what are some of the effects on reproductive performance um, associated with this declining uh, fertility of cows we see a reduction in oocyte vi viability reduced reduction in fertilization rates we see a less favorable uterine environment for early embryonic development we see lower concentrations of some of the reproductive hormones such as progesterone lower concentrations of progesterone before day seven of the estrus cycle following ovulation and fertilization can result in a reduction in embryo size and a decrease in pregnancy rates and this is thought to be related to less endometrial secretions of uh, uterine milk or what we call histotroph so um, at lower concentrations of progesterone um, do affect the uterine environment and this also affects the growth rates of embryos so we get a reduced embryonic growth rate and an increase in early embryonic loss um, placental insufficiency that the placentas and the surface area of the placentas is not as large as it should be and so you end up with a malnourished embryo you also get an increase in interestrous intervals and delayed return to estrus after AI of some cows and these are what what I've called phantom cows so what's happening is the cows are being inseminated eventually they're not pregnant to that insemination but they don't come back to heat uh, within 24 days and so instead of having a normal 18 to 24 day interval between heat some of these cows will have longer intervals and so you get delayed conception in some of these cows what are some of the consequences of a less favorable uterine environment fewer embryos reach the uterus following ovulation fewer embryos develop normally there's an increased failure of maternal recognition of pregnancy so embryos that are not growing as well they may not grow as large they may not produce as much interferon tau as what they would normally produce and so there's a failure of maternal recognition of pregnancy and then luteolysis occurs and, and, and you also get an increase in embryonic mortality so you're really producing an adverse environment for uh, embryonic uh, development and growth and this results in um, embryos failing to um, survive and you get uh, premature onset of luteolysis just a brief word about fan what we call or what I've called phantom cows these are cows that after they are inseminated they fail return to, to fail to return to estrus within 24 days of AI and eventually they end up being diagnosed as non-pregnant to the artificial insemination that they received the cows are a problem because by not returning to estrus the farmer thinks that they're pregnant however when they're pregnancy tested they turn up as being not pregnant to that original AI and sometimes the farmer thinks well gosh I thought that cow was pregnant because I haven't seen her in heat yeah. if you if you examine that population of cows these are these cows that don't return to estrus after AI but they're actually not pregnant to that AI you find that by the end of the year end of the breeding season they they, um, they demonstrate poor reproductive performance more of them will be diagnosed as non-pregnant at the end of the breeding season and, and as a result more of them will have to be culled the primary cause of the symptoms that they show that is a, fail, a, a delayed return to estrus is largely due to early embryonic loss so 18 to 24 days after AI they probably have an embryo that's present within their uterus but it's destined to die and that delays their return to estrus so this, these, can, these cows can be a problem this is just to illustrate some data that I had on if we look at this population of cows the cows that didn't return to estrus after their first insemination 
and we ended up being non-pregnant and we look at cows that were not pregnant to the first insemination but they actually returned within 24 days if you look at their reproductive performance seven weeks after the original AI you can see that between only 20 approximately 20 to 50 percent of these phantom cows are pregnant whether the rates are usually between 60 and nearly 70 percent for the cows that return to estrus. So you've got a 20 to 30 percent or more difference in pregnancy rate between these two populations of cows. If you look at their pregnancy rates at the end of the breeding season, in this case it's an 18 week breeding season, you can see that the cows that didn't return to estrus and those that did return to estrus, it's quite a marked difference um, in their final pregnancy rates almost a quarter of these cows overall are not pregnant um, following um, at the end of the breeding season compared to about 10 percent of these cows here so there's a 15 percent increase in loss of these populations of cows and that's going to be contributing to reduced reproductive performance graphically this is just looking at uh, the performance of cows that returned to estrus within 21 within 24 days of AI and those that didn't uh, and looking at their cumulative pregnancy rates over um, several uh, over a couple of months few months you can see the cows that, that returned to estrus um, show uh, improved uh, reproductive performance in every in most of these herds compared to those that didn't return So what can farmers do to try to reverse or prevent this deterioration in uh, reproductive performance amongst dairy cows? Well, it's, it's, it's a quite a difficult problem and um, if we knew the answers we would uh, be trying to turn the industry around. But what people are trying to do is to focus on genetics as one aspect and to include an estimated breeding value for fertility um, in um, genetic assessments of uh, size and this way if you select actively for fertility hopefully we can reverse this trend and there's already evidence to suggest that, that that's occurring because the, there's been some selection for genetics in the past decade um, and this is starting to slow the decline in reproductive performance it will be a slow progress because the heritability for fertility is, uh, is generally low um, because many, many a number of factors affect fertility so that, that will inevitably make the heritability low. Some people are crossbreeding. Um, this can help in some circumstances uh, and, but, but it may reduce milk yield. So again it depends on individual circumstances on, on farms whether that will be useful or not. But certainly some people are crossbreeding and that's improving their fertility but it's also costing them in terms of milk production. And this, for example, would be um, if a Holstein producer is concerned about their reproductive performance, then they may be using um, crossbreeding and, and using Jersey Holstein crosses or going to um, some other uh, different types of dairy breeds. Another factor that people are looking at is nutrition and trying to reduce the depth and duration of negative energy balance that is trying to just feed the cows better to try to um, ensure that they're not undergoing as much negative energy as severe negative energy balance um, which could exacerbate any fertility issues we've talked about the importance of optimizing body condition score at calving and reducing body condition score loss during lactation so that's an important message for farmers feed high quality forages particularly in early lactation and gradually increase the amount of concentrates rather than suddenly increase the amount of concentrates. A worst case scenario is cows uh, just fed hay during the transition period prior to calving and then they, the first day they calve all of a sudden they're whacked with seven eight kilograms of, um, of a cereal uh, supplement and this is a major change in their diet. Um, it's a low fiber diet and the rumen bacteria and protozoa etc are not adapted to it and so we want to avoid those types of situations and provide them with good quality forages and also good transition diets. Should try to maximize their dry matter intakes. Uh, if they're producing a lot of milk we want them to eat a lot 
um, so that they, they're not relying on their body weight to fuel that milk production. So try to um, have a management system that minimises disturbance to, to cows. Try to have an established hierarchy amongst the cows. As, as reduce whatever stresses you can to the cows. Optimise their welfare, health and diet. There may be um, um, some indicators that suggest that changing the composition of the diet may um, improve um, certain aspects of their nutrition, for example, if we could uh, increase the energy content of the diet without overloading cows with carbohydrate, um, such as certain fat supplements, um, or you um, use gluconeogenic substances, that is, things that liberate glucose within the small intestine rather than the rumen, this may help provide uh, cows with um, alternate forms of energy and reduce some of the um, uh, tendency to, to develop acidosis, ruminal acidosis. During the transition period we want to provide them with a well-nourished diet and a well-balanced diet. Other prevention strategies include heat detection. We need to optimise heat detection practices to ensure that if cows have shorter heats then we need to be quite vigilant in regards to our heat detection. Um, where, you, where farmers are having trouble with heat detection then they should consider fixed time insemination strategies um, to bypass heat, heat detection. We should also focus on health and welfare, optimize, optimize um, animal health and welfare to enable optimum dry matter intake and reduce stress. This could include reducing things such as dystocia, reducing the incidence of lameness and manage, lame, and manage lame cows, that is don't neglect cows that are lame but actually treat them. Um, use hygienic calving practices to try to minimise the number of uterine infections that cows get following calving. Once they get a uterine infection diagnose it and treat it promptly and then um, optimise neonatal health to reduce postnatal losses. So if it's, it's difficult to get cows pregnant, but once we produce a heifer calf, then we want to look after that heifer calf because it's taken quite a bit of effort and cost to get that calf on the ground. So this gives you a bit of an overview of um, some of the factors uh, and trends that have occurred um, in uh, dairy cattle reproductive performance over the last 20, 30, 40 years. A decline in fertility has been observed. You should be able to outline the problem that has been observed, list six potential reasons for the problem, and describe what strategy you would recommend to optimise the fertility of lactate and carry dairy cows both now and in the future. So we should pause the tape and just have a think about these issues uh, before we revise them. Over the past 20, 30 or more years, there's been a progressive uh, increase in milk yield, um, in particularly North American Holstein cows. Um, this has been associated with a progressive reduction in conception rate, which on average uh, may be approximately 0.5% per year, and in some studies it's been as, as high as 1% per year. And so conception rates 20, 30, 40 years ago, which were in the order of 60%, now are 40% or less um, in um, some high-producing uh, Holstein herds. This has resulted in a reduction in reproductive performance. Um, other things that have been associated with this trend have been an increase in interestrous intervals, um, a deep an increase in calving to conception intervals and the interval from calving to first ovulation so an increase in postpartum and estrus intervals an increase in the number of days open or the number of days cows uh, take to get pregnant following calving an increase in the number of services per conception so an increase in the number of times that uh, cows need to be inseminated before they're diagnosed pregnant. Also been a reduction in the duration 
and in the intensity of estrus associated with this increase in milk yield. What are six potential reasons for the problem? Um, I've asked you here for six reasons, of course there's a number of them. And the, as I mentioned the problem is likely to be multifactorial um, because the problem is, is not really observed in heifers but it's only after they calve that we start to see the problem and we suspect that it's issues that occur following calving that are associated with the problem. And these, these include um, sudden increase in dry matter intake that's required, sudden increase in metabolic rate, get a decrease in circulating concentrations of hormones such as progesterone and estrogen associated with that increase in metabolic rate. This may have consequences for uh, embryonic growth rates and um, as a consequence of that um, embryos may not be able to undertake the process of maternal recognition of pregnancy as well. They not, perhaps don't produce as much interferon tau and so cows undergo premature luteolysis. There's likely to be an increase in negative energy balance associated with uh, large increases in milk production but an inability of these cows to eat as much as they need or for, for us to actually supply them with a diet that is appropriate for their needs. In response to that uh, we've tried to increase the energy density of diets but in doing so we've increased the amount of carbohydrate and this increases the risk that rumin ruminal acidosis occurs and this has negative consequences uh, not only on their um, ability to digest food but also has negative health consequences as well. There's also an increase in the prevalence of anestrous cows and uh, the duration with of um, the postpartum anestrous interval and there may be other unknown effects as well. We also get a reduction in oocyte viability, a reduction in fertilization rates, less favorable uterine environments for early embryonic development, a reduction in, early, in embryonic growth rates, an increase in early embryonic loss, placental in insufficiency and an increase in interestrous intervals so you get a delayed return to estrus after AI in some of these cows and that can reduce overall reproductive performance. So the question I've asked you is for to list six potential reasons for the problem. You can see there's quite a number to choose from um, to answer that question. What strategies could you use to optimize the fertility of lactating dairy cows both now and in the future? Um, well we can start selecting cows for fertility so we can select bulls that have a high estimated breeding value and EBV for fertility that's above average and uh, because the heritability of fertility is low uh, this is going to be a slow process but at least it will um, provide uh, selection pressure to try to improve reproductive performance and fertility in cows and recent data would suggest that when we genetically select cows for fertility we can actually start to stop this downward trend in reproductive performance. Other strategies that are more, perhaps more effective in the short term include crossbreeding um, or selecting breeds of cows that perhaps have higher inherent fertility. We can also try to manage cows to optimize their health, welfare and to reduce stress. We can try to balance their diet at each stage of their lactation to um, seek to optimize their nutrition. This includes providing them with an adequate diet in the, in the transition period um, and then following calving that uh, their diet is appropriate. In addition to those we could also um, manage uterine disease, um, try to diagnose it and treat it um, so that uh, cows are not affected by uterine infections. Um, to try to minimize those as well we should um, conduct hygienic um, practices at the time of calving and try to minimize the number of dystocias that cows are getting. So a number of factors that we can do to try to help uh, minimize um, the impact of um, uh, lowered fertility in cows and, and try to treat them um, with a bit more care. So this gives you a quick overview of um, some of the recent trends in reproductive performance in dairy cows 
and what some of the current management strategies are to try to prevent this from being um, too severe. However, it is a difficult task for farmers um, and it's something that they are frequently frustrated by. Nevertheless, we hope with the changes in genetic selection and improvements in nutrition that we'll be able to um, hopefully reverse this negative trend and hopefully look to see it improving in the future.